Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, Trust and Probate, the Sale of Real Property with Attorney Jennifer Sinex. Before getting started, I would like to remind everyone of NSDCR's Industry Chit Chat number 12, scheduled for August the 6th at 9 a.m. with the DRE Commissioner, Doug McCauley. To register, please go to NSDCAR slash webinars. And now I'll turn the uh, webinar over to Jennifer. Good morning, everyone. I'm Jennifer Sinex, and I'm a partner at White and Bright in Escondido. Many of you might have attended uh, webinars or presentations by Fred Fister, who's one of the managing partners here, whose practice area is real estate and litigation. Um, he asked me to present, and I'm presenting on the topic of real property sales during trust and probate administration. This slide contains my contact information. Please feel free to call me or email me with any questions that you might have after the presentation, or if you wanna set up some sort of a chat, we can do that. Um, during the presentation, if you have questions, we've opened up a chat box. So we'd like you to use the chat box to address any questions that you may have, and I'll answer them all at the end of the slideshow. Also, I wanted to point out that uh, Shirley has emailed out the PowerPoint and a PDF. Um, a few slides have been edited since that PDF was emailed. I had a few small typos that I corrected and I actually added three slides. So if you see some slides here that, that are uh, not in your packet, just wait a minute and we'll get to your slide. Um, and we'll email this out um, after the program. So I've broken down this presentation into sales of real property owned by a trust, sales of real property that are subject to probate, and then practical and legal considerations regarding both of those categories of sales. So why would you want to sell a state property during a probate or a trust administration? Uh, common reasons are to raise cash, to pay creditors, and costs of administration. Costs of administration include everything from funeral and burial expenses to uh, attorney's fees and taxes. Um, also, if you need to avoid the cost of maintaining a state property, so you may have a piece of real property that um, is kind of a, um, a bottomless pit of expenses, there may be expensive property taxes or there could be a lot of deferred maintenance on the property that makes it not economical to keep it within the estate and distribute it. Also, often you want to avoid distributing fractional interest in real property. So if, for example, mom and dad pass away and they leave real property to son and daughter, perhaps son and daughter don't want to be co-tenants on the property, but instead it might be more beneficial to sell the real property and to distribute cash. Some pre-sale issues on the practical side of things that you might encounter as a broker with your client um, our personal belongings in the estate. These things can cause delay if, for example, there's a hoarder situation, or let's say you have an out-of-state personal representative who cannot be in California to remove personal property items from the house, or there's a contest among beneficiaries about personal property items. So personal belongings can be a cause for delay of sale. Also, if you have a crime or a death scene in a house, a decedent died in the premises, um, there may be some remediation required, and also there may be required disclosures as a result of that. Um, sales subject to leases, you may have tenants occupying the property. Um, there might have to be unlawful detainer actions to remove people from the premises. Obviously, these things cause delays, particularly during COVID when those kinds of um, actions were largely, uh, there was a moratorium on that. I believe that that's going to open up again if it hasn't already. Uh, there may be title issues that have to be cleared up, so that may cause delay. Also, there may be conditions in the trust or the will itself, um, such as a condition to sell to a family member who may, may or may not qualify for the loan. Or maybe there is a, an estate where the real property is of the majority of the value of the estate. So maybe you have a brother and sister and a million dollar estate, and the real property is worth $800,000. So it may cause some delay if, for example, brother wants to take the house because 50% of the estate is what the brother's entitled to and the county recorder will reassess a portion of the property that goes to brother that's in excess of the value he was to receive from the estate. So there's a reassessment issue and there's some tricky rules about how to get around that reassessment. I'll just tell you briefly that um, the brother, for example, cannot take his own loan and 
uh, purchase the property from the estate without that reassessment still occurring. What has to happen is the executor or the administrator in that capacity have to obtain the loan, and those are generally not the most favorable loan terms, and then inject the cash into the estate, equalize cash to the sister, distribute the house to the brother, and then he would refi out of that unfavorable loan. So we run into that more often than not, and uh, we actually refer that type of situation to some people who do that on a, on a daily basis, those types of loans, but they're not the greatest um, loan terms. So what are the various fiduciary roles in the post-death administration of the decedent's estate? We're gonna talk separately about trustees, um, and they are acting when property is owned by a trust. Executors and administrators are uh, the fiduciaries when property is subject to a probate proceeding, or they can be referred to as a successor in interest for property of, quote, small value that's not owned by a trust or not subject to a probate proceeding. And we'll talk about that threshold value that takes it out of the probate proceeding and, and converts it to a successor in interest transfer. So why does fiduciary capacity matter? It matters to attorneys and it matters to the executor, the trustee or the administrator because they need to execute contracts and documents in their fiduciary capacity in order to avoid personal liability. So in a broker or agent's wheelhouse, this would be referring to real estate listing agreements, purchase agreements, any required disclosures that might require their signature, title and escrow documents, um, there's also something called a purchase agreement probate addendum that you might have encountered. All of these documents need to be completed and, and signed in their capacity as trustee or executor or successor in interest. So here are some examples of signing in their fiduciary capacity that we would look for as an attorney reviewing uh, the real estate documentation. Um, for example, Jennifer J. Sinek's trustee of the Jennifer J. Sinek's trust dated September 19th. Obviously, some of that may not fit on the line. I would just type the remainder of it below the line if you have to do that or go to Adobe PDF and get it in there. Um, or Jennifer J. Sinek's executor of the estate of Mark Philip Smith, if I had been appointed executor by the probate court. Or Jennifer J. Sinek's successor in interest to the estate, estate of Mark Philip Smith. So what is a trustee? Trustees are individuals or licensed private professional fiduciaries or corporate entities who have the power to act on behalf of a trust. You may encounter a private professional fiduciary who is not a private professional fiduciary licensed in California, who may not be required to be licensed. So it's, it's not really your concern whether they, they're duly licensed or not. That's the attorney's concern who represents them. Um, but in California, they do have to be licensed. Corporate entities would be, for example, if Union Bank was acting as trustee or Northern Trust was acting as trustee. And from where does their authority to act derive? The trust itself will contain a list of powers and limitations on powers, and also the California Probate Code contains powers and limitations on powers. It's worth noting that um, the trust itself can expand or limit on some powers that are conferred in the probate code as long as they don't violate public policy. So for example, what is a power that, that can be restricted? Um, the power to sell real property is a good example in this, in this case. Um, what could they not restrict? They can't eliminate, for example, some notice requirements under the probate code. What is an executor? An executor is an individual, a private professional fiduciary or corporate entity nominated in a will to be appointed by the probate court in a decedent's estate. If the person died without a will, that personal representative is referred to instead as an administrator, generally. Um, I'm gonna refer to them sort of interchangeably throughout the rest of the presentation without distinction. So when is a probate required? If the gross fair market value of the decedent's real and personal property as of their death is greater than $166,250 in 2020, this is indexed for inflation, it was formerly 150,000, you might be familiar with that figure, and the property is not owned by a trust or titled with right of survivorship or for example, a transfer on death deed, then a probate proceeding is usually required in order to appoint an executor or an administrator to transfer or sell real property. And their authority 
to act as derived from powers and limitations set forth in the probate code and also in the decedent's will if they had a will. If the will directs that the property is to be sold, they must sell the real property. And then they may sell the real property if the will authorizes the sale. If there's no will, they can still, still sell real property um, and they may or may not have to request authority from the court to confirm the sale but they will have to request authority under the Independent Administration of Estates Act, IAEA, um, in order to either have full authority to make the sale, which means no comp court confirmation would be required, or limited or no authority, um, in which case it would have to, the sale would have to be returned to the court for confirmation. What is a successor in interest? A successor in interest uh, may be an individual or a group of individuals who are the heirs at law under California law. So the probate code sets forth who inherits property when there is no will. And it's, it's basically, it's called intestate succession statute. It's basically a family tree next of kin. So if no probate administration is open and, or a probate has been closed and then there's an after discovered asset, the successor in interest might be uh, an individual or group of individual heirs. Also, an individual or group of individuals who are beneficiaries under the will can be successors in interest, including a trustee when the will is a pour over will, which says that um, if I left anything out of my trust, I want it to pour over into my trust. Um, if there's no probate administration required, but or there had been a probate on some assets, that probate had been closed, or there's an after discovered asset, the successor in interest might be a beneficiary under the will. Here's an example of when a successor in interest might also be the trustee. Um, John Kennedy executed a trust and a pour over will, naming his trust as beneficiary in case any property was inadvertently subject to probate proceedings after his death due to a failure to retitle it in the trust. He died owning a lot in San Bernardino County worth $54,000 and it was titled individually as John Kennedy, a single man. He acquired it after the trust was executed and forgot to put it in his trust, for example. John's trustee after his death, Robert Kennedy, can follow the procedure for executing and filing an affidavit real property of small value with the San Bernardino County Probate Court or, and Recorder's Office to transfer the property to himself as trustee and then he would contract with the broker to sell the real property in his capacity as trustee of John's trust. So a successor's an interest author authority to act derives from um, having an estate where the gross fair mar market value of all of the assets in the individual's name, not including, again, jointly titled assets or assets that pass via a transfer on death deed, as of the date of death are less than $166,250. So these are the two mechanisms for a successor and in interest to transfer real property. The first is called a petition to determine succession to real property. And the petition is required to be filed with the probate court if the gross fair market value of the real property as of the date of death is greater than $55,425, but does not exceed $166,250. If the property is less than $55,425, then an affidavit real property of small value can be used to transfer the real property. In both cases one and two, you first have to obtain a, an appraisal by a California probate referee. A probate referee is appointed in the case of a probate proceeding um, to appraise real property as of date of death. So in, if you filed a petition to determine succession to real property or affidavit real property of small value, you would simply contact a duly appointed um, California probate referee, ask for the appraisal, you would submit it in the petition proceeding, and then the court would issue an order determining succession to real property that could be recorded. Or with the affidavit, you simply have the affidavit signed by the personal representative and along with the inventory and appraisal signed by the probate referee, you go to the court clerk's office and they stamp it. And then that document without a court hearing um, or a separate court order can be recorded with the county recorder's office. And that would be sufficient to transfer the property into the name of the successor in interest. A practical consideration is that um, attorneys would generally not advise that a successor in interest sell real property in that capacity. 
Instead, we would advise them to transfer the property to the ultimate beneficiary or heir who would then become the seller. Otherwise, the successor in interest could expose themselves to personal liability for the sales transaction, and there may not be sufficient other assets in, uh, available for, from that decedent's estate to pay for the defense of that successor in interest if they were sued, for example, by um, a prospective buyer. We're going to go through three practical considerations prior to the sale that are very relevant to real estate brokers or agents. One is the written contract, um, exclusive written, uh, excuse, excuse me, exclusive listing agreements and compensation of the broker. For the sale of real property, a written contract is required to hire, hire a real estate broker. We would, of course, always advise that um, to our individual friends as well as to our fiduciary clients. Um, the broker may associate other licensed real estate brokers, including using an MLS, and a listing agent must be a real estate licensee. Exclusive listing agreements entered into by trustees do not require court approval, and the trustee may negotiate the length of the exclusive listing agreement. As a practical matter, we would always advise a trustee to be reasonable about the length of that exclusive listing agreement because everything that a fiduciary does is subject to scrutiny by, excuse me, scrutiny by beneficiaries. So we would um, advise that they, that they enter into something that's customary and not, not um, something very unusual. Exclusive listing agreements by executors and administrators. If the probate court has granted full authority under the Independent Administration of a States Act, which we're going we're to learn about that, they can enter into an exclusive listing contract without court approval and without giving something called a notice of proposed action. In other words, they can just enter into it for a 90-day period, and then they can renew the listing agreement for subsequent 90-day periods up to 270 days. So they can't at the outset sign a 270-day exclusive listing agreement, but they can enter into subsequent 90-day um, exclusive listing agreements. For executors and administrators who are not granted full authority or limited authority, they are only granted limited authority, they have to first obtain prior court approval before entering into the exclusive listing agreement. And again, that period is for 90 days, and then each extension for 90 days has to be um, pursuant to a court petition and court order. For compensation of agents or brokers by the trustee, um, the trustee can negotiate the, the sales commissions. It's not set by statute. Again, we would just advise that whatever the sales commission is um, customarily that they stick to that and not go out of the box. Um, Compensation of an agent or broker by an executor. If it's a court supervised sale of real property where the executor or the administrator has not been granted full authority under the Independent Administration of the States Act, there is a local rule, San Diego local probate rule on sales commissions. And you'll see in the highlighted text, the court may not allow a sales commission in excess of 5% on improved real property or 10% on unimproved property such as vacant lots, absent good cause shown for a larger commission. And the court has to be advised whether the broker is the buyer or has an interest in the, in the buyer, meaning um, is the broker a member of an LLC that's purchasing the property? Do they own stock in a closely held corporation that's purchasing the property? That has to be disclosed to the court. And again, this is for um, executors or administrators that do not have full authority under the Independent Administration of the States Act. As a practical matter, we would advise an executor who does have full authority to not exceed that 5% broker commission unless we obtained prior court approval because we would not want to invite um, beneficiaries who might have a problem with that broker commission to petition the court. So I'm going to stop for one second and talk about the Independent Administration of the States Act. Uh, when you petition to appoint an executor or an administrator, you have to, on the petition for probate, check whether you're seeking powers under the IAEA or not. Um, ordinarily, you want to seek those powers so that you don't have to go back to court to get court approval of so many individual transactions. Um, the court is generally going to allow that if the will doesn't prohibit um, acting under the IAER. 
uh, excuse me, IAEA, but um, for practical reasons, sometimes the court will not grant full powers. So for example, if you can't get all the beneficiaries to waive a bond and the personal representative may not be able to qualify for a full bond, um, which they have to do on their own personal credit, you might petition the court for limited powers under the IAEA. That allows the personal representative to not have to get a bond in the full amount, but it protects the beneficiaries because then the court is supervising the acts of that fiduciary. The probate estate in a probate proceeding is generally not liable to an agent or a broker or auctioneer under a contract for sale for any fee or commission or other compensation or expenses unless the sale is actually made and confirmed by the court if that's required and the sale is consummated. So now we're gonna go into some legal considerations for sales by trustees and executors. And we'll try again to break it down by sales by trustees versus sales by executors with full authority under the IAEA, meaning the court confirmation is not required for the sale itself and then when court confirmation of sales is required. For sales by trustees, no statute requires that sales of real property held in a trust be confirmed by a court, no statute. Most trusts authorize the sale of real property, but the trust can limit or prohibit the sale of real property. So for example, it can direct that real property be sold to a particular person or that a particular person is granted or a class of people are granted a right of first refusal, or it can direct that property not be sold, for example, a family cabin, or that it be sold only after a term of years. For sales by executors, uh, to review, some real property sales can be made without prior court approval and some require court approval. So sales by executors with full IAEA powers do not require court confirmation if the will doesn't require that it's court supervised. This is a very rare situation, but someone who sets forth in their will that a court confirmation is required uh, may be motivated to do so because they have uh, concerns about contests between beneficiaries regarding that particular sale. So they may decide that that's a, a more um, expeditious way to, to get the property sold. Um, but if the will does not expressly prohibit the executor from acting with full authority and the probate court grants full authority, or there's no will and the probate court still grants full authority to an administrator, then the court confirmation of the sale is, is not required. An executor with full authority under the IAEA can sell real property without court confirmation if they give notice of proposed action. Notice of proposed action is set forth in the probate code and it requires that 15 days notice is given to interested persons before taking the action. Interested persons are the heirs or the beneficiaries um, typically and can also be the creditors. If no objection to the action is presented in that 15 day period, then the executor can move forward with the sale. And by the way, if they don't receive an objection, that's a deemed consent. So you don't have to receive consents to the proposed action, you just have to not receive an objection to the proposed action. The procedure, if there is an objection received to the proposed action is that either the objector or the personal representative, meaning the executor or the administrator, can petition the probate court regarding the transaction. So the one thing that can't happen is if you receive an objection, you cannot move forward with the transaction that's set forth in the notice of proposed action. You'll have to get court approval of going forward with that or you abandon it and you go a different direction. So actions requiring a notice of proposed action that might, uh, you might encounter as real estate agents or brokers Again, selling real property, which we've talked about, exchanging real property, for example, a 1031 exchange, um, executing a mortgage or deed of trust. So maybe you represent an executor or a trustee and they're purchasing real property. Um, granting options to purchase real property and transferring property pursuant 
to an option holder exercising their option um, would require a notice of proposed action. Completing a decedent's contract to convey real property. So maybe you are representing somebody and they pass away before the transaction is complete. Um, the uh, personal representative can continue with that contract, but they would first have to issue a notice of proposed action with that 15 day waiting period. Uh, leasing real property for longer than one year and granting a broker an exclusive right to sell a state real property of a period of more than 270 days, you would issue a NOPA for that as well. And by the way, with the NOPA period is 15 days, but sometimes you can get everyone to consent to a waiver of that NOPA period. So if there's an urgency, um, for example, is, is completing a decedent's contract to convey real property. Let's say you're in escrow and, and there's an emergency. If you can get every, every beneficiary as an attorney and get every beneficiary to consent to waiving the notice, then you could move forward with that transaction. Here are some problems that we sometimes encounter when we issue notices of proposed action. Sometimes uh, someone who receives the notice has an issue with the listing price. So a common scenario is, again, brother and sister are beneficiaries, brother's also the executor. He has contracted with a, a real estate broker or agent to sell the, the home that the parents lived in. Um, they have looked at the sales comps and arrived at a sales price or listing price, but sister thinks it's worth a lot more. So we see that kind of frequently and we, we deal with that by trying to um, provide to that beneficiary um, underlying um, support for why that listing price was arrived at. Another thing that we see sometimes uh, people have issues with is, is as is terms. So when attorneys are advising personal representatives, trustees, executors, administrators, we typically advise that sales should occur on an as-is basis. And the reason for that is it's true that sometimes repairs and improvements can make a big difference in the, in the price of a home. Um, but also it's true that beneficiaries can complain about the amount of money that you spend for those improvements or those repairs. And it's especially tricky for a personal representative if they have engaged um, contractor to come in and do these things and for some reason there's a market downturn. So they've exposed themselves to liability for breach of their fiduciary duty to preserve assets if in fact what they put into the property doesn't, doesn't uh, come back as a return on the sales price. And sometimes we see when we issue a notice of proposed action objections to sales in general. So you might just have a difficult family member, somebody who just is, is just unhappy, maybe it's due to grief, uh, maybe they still, they have a problem with the executor that goes back to when they were both in the first grade. Um, sometimes people can just be difficult about things. Um, or maybe it is more of an emotional uh, reaction to selling the family home. Um, somebody really doesn't want to see the family home gone or they think that mom or dad would not have actually wanted that. We hear that a lot. Um, Sometimes it's the situation where a beneficiary wants to purchase the home, but they can't quite qualify for conventional loan terms. So they're scrambling around and wanting more time to try to secure financing so that they can complete the purchase. So even an executor who has full authority under the IAEA has to obtain court approval if they're selling the property to themselves or to their attorney unless the executor is the sole heir or beneficiary or all of the other heirs or beneficiaries consent to it and creditors would not be harmed by that sale. When would creditors be harmed by a sale? If it's a relatively illiquid estate and the decedent owed money to uh, their credit card company, for example, or any other creditor, and the house needs to be sold in order to pay the creditors. And even where court confirmation is not required, sometimes an executor under the IAEA may want to still seek court confirmation. Why would they want to do that? Again, concern that a beneficiary might object to the sale. So rather than um, moving forward in such a way that could um, take longer delays from court hearings, if they just simply subject the sale to a court hearing, there's going to be a finite resolution. It might not drag out. 
And again, court confirmation of a sale is required for those executors or administrators that are granted limited IAEA powers. And so the way the statute is written is it says that executors with limited authority um, may take all the actions permitted to an executor with full authority, except, and as, as is relevant to this presentation, um, the executor needs prior court approval to sell real property, exchange real property, grant an option to purchase real property, or to borrow funds giving real property as security. So actions that an executor can take without court approval or notice of proposed action, they can make repairs or alterations to buildings or other estate properties. And again, the caveat to that is we, we try to limit that substantially um, because we don't want beneficiaries to complain about liquid assets being spent um, on repairs or improvements and when we're not certain that the return on sale will, will justify it. An exception to that though is sometimes we'll have beneficiaries and they've agreed among themselves that they think that certain repairs or improvements would greatly enhance the value of the property. And if they're all willing to sign uh, a waiver of liability for the trustee in an agreement uh, to that effect, we we're fine with that as attorneys. Um, you also don't need court authorization to grant an exclusive right to sell or exclusive listing agreement for up to 90 days. And that this is true whether you have full or limited authority under the IAEA. So sales can occur either by public sale or private auction. Uh, public sale, uh, well, first of all, um, executor can sell real or personal property at a private sale or a public auction. Most estate sales of real property occur at private sales. A private sale is one in which, um, and this is in the case of executor, uh, bids are solicited independently of each other. Now bids are going to be solicited when you have limited authority or no authority under the IAEA. Um, again, if you have full authority under the IAEA, you are going to issue a notice of proposed action because you've already selected who you want the buyer to be and you're going to disclose the terms of that sale in that notice of proposed action. So this is pertaining to someone who does not have full authority, they're going to solicit bids and we'll, we'll go into what that process looks like, the technicalities of that process. A public auction sale um, is, if, as you're familiar with, you receive bids in an open competitive bidding setting. That's also what can happen in a court confirmation sale. It can be opened up for overbid and it can become a, an auction in that um, court hearing. So whether the method is a private sale or a public auction, um, if the executor only has limited powers, he has to first publish or, or post notice of the sale. If they have full authority under the IAEA, they do not need to publish or post notice of a sale of real property. Public auction sales. An executor can contract in writing with an auctioneer who needs to be licensed under the civil code to conduct the public auction of the estate's property. And the contract with the auctioneer has to permit the executor to reserve or withdraw property from the sale and can fix the auctioneer's compensation. That's to be paid from the proceeds of the sale in amounts determined by the court. In larger cities, auctions are usually handled by a professional auctioneer, but in smaller towns, an attorney can often supervise the auction. So unless full authority is granted under the IAEA to an executor, publication is required. And the publication looks like it's called a notice of intent to sell real property at private sale. There's a sample of that notice in the back of your packet that you can take a look at, um, but we're going to go through those requirements in these slides. So publication, though, is not required um, when the power to sell is conferred in the will to the actual person acting as executor. So if my will says that John Smith has the power to sell the real property known as 925 Blackacre, then publication would not be required under the probate code. Also, uh, if the will directs sale of that real property, so my executor may say, sell 925 Blackacre, that doesn't require publication. But if it says my executor may sell 925 
uh, or direct is directed to sell 925 Blackacre, and instead you're selling 5339 Adwar Court, then you are going to have to publish as to Adwar Court if you don't have full authority under the IAEA. So these are the contents of that notice, notice of intent to sell real property at private sale. The notice specifies that the sale is subject to court confirmation because again, the executor doesn't have full authority under the IAEA. It gives notice of the date, the time, and the location of the court hearing. That's going to confirm the sale. It notifies that the sale will be to the highest bidder. It describes the real property in particular. So it contains the address, the legal description, the APN. It states that the sale is subject to the current taxes, covenants, conditions, restrictions, reservations, rights, rights of way, easements, and whether any encumbrances are to be satisfied from the purchase price or the purchaser is to assume any encumbrances. And when the representative is going to warrant title, it states that the property is, is sold as is except for title. Uh, bids or offers must be in writing and received at the office of the attorney for the executor anytime after first publication and before a sale is made. The bids themselves, again, have to be in writing. They are delivered to the executor or other person listed in the notice as a practical matter, probably the attorney for the executor's office. Um, they may be filed with the court, but they're not customarily filed with the court. If it's a credit sale, the interest rate on deferred payments and the starting date of interest payments should be specified in the bid. If the bid provides for purchase subject to existing encumbrances, the deposit has to be paid to the executor and not to the attorney or broker. That's just specified in the probate code. Um, the name and manner in which title is to be taken should be fixed at the outset. The buyer should be required to obtain his or her own property inspection. That's really important that that's, that's set forth in writing because at the court confirmation on the sale, if a buyer has not been or can show that they have not been provided a reasonable opportunity for an inspection, the sales um, hearing can be continued by the court. For the original bidder and broker, and by that they mean the person whose bid the executor wants to accept, um, should be informed of the time and place of the hearing on the court confirmation so that they can protect their interests if there are overbids. What this means is that the, the bidder, the buyer, and their broker should be present at the court hearing on the court confirmation of the sale because if there are overbids then people can outbid each other and they need to uh, be there to represent their interest if they're interested in, in trying to overbid an overbidder. Again, if the broker or the brokerage firm has a direct or indirect interest, meaning they want to uh, in the purchaser, so the broker is the purchaser or the broker um, is a member of an LLC that wants to purchase the property, the broker will not be allowed a commission. So that's interesting to, to note. So once you've decided on a, on a bid that you're interested in as the executor, um, you petition the court for confirmation of the sale. It has to be filed within 30 days of accepting the bid. The real property has to have been appraised within one year of sale, and that again would be by the California probate referee. Why is this important? Because in a private sale, the amount of the bid, meaning this is this, not a public auction, is distinguished from a public auction. The amount of the bid has to be at least 90% of that appraisal value. And if at the hearing the court finds that the price and the other sales terms are fair and conform with the probate code, the court's going to ask for any increased bids being made to the court. So they're going to ask in open court, are there any bid uh, overbids? And if such an overbid is not made, then the court can confirm the sale to that original bidder and fix the broker commission. But if, on the other hand, an overbid is submitted, there are some requirements for overbids. So it gets really technical at these hearings. It's, it's kind of a mathematical um, exercise. If the overbid is higher than the original bid by at least 10% of the first 10,000 and 5% on anything over that first 10,000 for a minimum bid of $100, the court can confirm the sale to the increased bidder. If, however, it's a credit sale, then the court has to first obtain the executor 
or their counsel's consent before accepting that higher bid. So if you are representing a client who wants to purchase a state real property at a probate court confirmation hearing, it's advisable that they be able to come in with an all cash offer with enough cash for their overbid because that's more likely than not going to be accepted assuming they're the higher bidder. And again, the court has to continue the sale if it's shown that the executor did not provide an opportunity, a reasonable opportunity for inspection. Um, but if good cause is shown to confirm the sale, the court will confirm the sale and not continue that hearing. And finally, title passes to the purchaser, it says only on, on the executor's conveyance after court confirmation. So the court's gonna confirm the sale and then there will be an executor's deed that is, is um, executed and recorded. If the purchaser defaults on the purchase, fails to comply with the terms of the sale um, after the court confirmation, the court may vacate the order on the petition and award damages to the estate um, against a defaulting purchaser. So for example, there was a case called Estate of Felder. And in that case, the court held that the estate was entitled to retain the entire deposit of a defaulting purchaser, even though the purchaser was purchasing a one half interest in the property. So at least there's a remedy for default if you go through this entire court process, which is very technical. So some practical considerations and concluding remarks. Most sales of real property, fortunately, uh, during a state administration by trustees and executors and administrators do not require court confirmation. That's obviously a very complicated process and it, it really requires um, a lot of uh, attention to detail. Um, again, attorneys will generally advise trustees and executors that property should be sold on an as-is basis. Um, because trustees and executors have a duty to preserve estate assets and these improvements or repairs could invite complaints by beneficiaries unless they all will consent in writing to it. Um, attorneys generally want to review listing and sales agreements to ensure that the client is signing in their fiduciary capacity. So we like to work really cooperatively with brokers during the sales process. And uh, we obviously don't represent the broker, but we um, really like to review the paperwork and um, sometimes brokers have questions about um, things like repairs and improvements, and then we may have to go back to the beneficiaries and, upon the broker's recommendation and say, hey, it appears that we really do have to fix this, you know, these problems in this bathroom, for example. Um, attorneys Fred Fister and Michael Friedrichs here at White and Bright um, are real estate attorneys, so they can represent agents and brokers and clients in these issues that we've raised during this presentation, such as landlord tenant issues, when you need to remove someone from a property so that it can be sold, um, or there's some issue with a lease, for example, or even title issues and broker liability issues. So I know that they're representing brokers as well. And I wanna remind you again that there's the sample purchase agreement probate addendum in your materials, as well as that notice of sale of real property at public or private sale. Um, the sample purchase agreement probate addendum is something that we like to see in that packet because it then puts the buyer on notice that there may be this court confirmation proceeding. It specifically goes into that. That's really important because again, we don't want, um, we want as, as much as you do for the sales transaction to be as tight, tightly wound as possible to prevent later um, escape valves for people who are going to try to default on the purchase. I wanna thank the North San Diego County Association of Realtors and especially Shirley Carroll for giving me this opportunity to, prevent, to present to you today. And um, we're just really happy. We have a, a great relationship with that organization here at White and Bright. And so now I wanna open it up to questions. I'm not seeing, oh, okay, here we go. Okay, well, I have a couple of comments. One is that I spoke too quickly. I apologize for that. Again, I've got my contact information on, on one of those first few slides and I'd be more than happy to even just sit down with anybody who would like to do that and we can go through this presentation or any other questions that you may have if I blew through it too quickly. Um, oh, okay, someone is asking, when is a bond required? Um, a bond can be required because a will or a trust requires a bond. Usually a bond is waived in a will or trust, so it would not be required. 
But if, for example, a will named, um, let's say, number one, two, and three persons to act as executor, and none of them were able to act as executor, the court might require a bond in that case. Also, when you have an out-of-state personal representative or San Diego local probate rule, so let's say mom and dad pass away and brother from Texas wants to act as executor, we can represent out-of-state executors and trustees with no problem if, a, if the matter is a California administration. However, um, there's a $20,000 minimum bond required for out-of-state personal representatives. So it's, uh, you know, if you ever have questions about that, we can help you with that. Okay, another question. Um, can you give an example using the, okay, wait, hang on, I've got to scroll up because all of a sudden we're getting a lot of questions. This is about the minimum overbid process. It's something I, I hope to not have to deal with very often. Okay, it says on page 39, where is the notice referenced published? Let me see slide 39 and see if I can find out where that is. Hold on. Oh, okay, so the probate code requires that it be published in a newspaper. I, I believe it's in the county in which the property is located. There's some requirements in the probate code. So that's generally where you, where you would figure that out. So I think it's the same newspapers where you would publish um, notice of a decedent's estate in a probate proceeding, just when you open the probate. Okay, let me scroll down and see what else we have. Okay, can you give an example using the minimum overbid amounts allowed, 10% and 5%? Well, it's hard because it's math, but 10% um, overbid on amounts up to $10,000. So 10% of $10,000 would be that minimum overbid. Um, if it's over $10,000, it would be an additional 5% um, would be the minimum overbid that would be submitted to the court. So you're, you're literally sitting in the courtroom with a calculator figuring out the math of what the next minimum overbid would have to be. After that first minimum overbid, um, I do not believe that the next overbidder has to also um, tack on another 10 and 5%. I believe they just simply have to overbid by a certain amount, but uh, not, I don't think that that's incremental. And then another question, how often does the seller or beneficiary allow the law office to select the realtor? That's a really good question. Um, usually, the personal representative asks us um, to find a realtor um, if, if that's necessary, but to be honest, usually the next door neighbor is a realtor or they already know a realtor. So we don't usually get involved that often with selection of a realtor. Practically, the only time that happens is when you've got somebody out of the area who's acting as a personal representative, then they may ask us to help them select a realtor. And then when that happens, we usually give them three or four names so that they can decide who fits their, uh, their personality best. If a capacity form is signed, is fiduciary capacity needed on every signature? We like to see it on every signature, we do. Um, maybe that's overkill, but that's just how attorneys like to, like to roll. <laughs> Um, let's see. As an agent, what is the best way to build relationships to service these listings? I love the technical process and would love to learn more about this part of the business. I'll be honest with you, we get telephone calls from basically solicitations from realtors who watch, um, I don't know how they do it, I don't know where they find the time, but they, they actually watch, uh, they must be watching the probate filings because um, they'll contact us and usually when we file a petition for probate that gives contact information and they'll ask whether we need someone to sell the probate real property. Um, so that's, that's generally how we get, uh, we get contacted about it. So the next question, if there's a deed on death and real property is the only or majority asset, what happens with creditors? That's a really good question. So this, this transfer on death deed that California has now that allows you to put essentially a beneficiary on your deed itself, um, that property would pass to that beneficiary, but there is um, distributee liability. So if I'm a creditor and um, 
I'm, I'm owed money in a probate estate. I can even be the petitioner and become an executor if I'm the creditor and nobody else has priority of appointment. But if I know as a creditor that property has been distributed to somebody, there is distributee liability and you can go after them. Um, but there's only a one year period that creditors have to file a creditor claim. So I would, as a creditor, I would open a probate proceeding and then I would file a creditor claim and then I would petition for instructions. Can the overbidder be an individual who is not represented by a realtor? Yes, anybody can show up in court. If they can figure out the math on how to properly execute overbids, then they can certainly be an overbidder. Okay, I don't see any more questions. Let me see if, I, if I've missed anybody. Um, I think that may be it. And again, I just really want to thank everybody for, for giving me the opportunity to be here today and especially Shirley for helping me um, navigate the Zoom, the Zoom world. Um, the, the benefit of Zoom is that we don't have to sit here all wearing masks and we can be comfortable in our own offices, um, but it, there is something lost and you know, we get to uh, mingle afterward. But again, I just want to say thank you so much. And because I don't see, um, I don't see any other let me make sure, I just want to make sure I don't see any other questions. So I'm going to go ahead and end the meeting. My contact information is on that second slide, I believe. Please feel free to reach out to me with any questions. And I'm going to go ahead and um, email this, this updated PowerPoint out to Shirley so she can get it to the entire group. Thank you so much.